The Northern Irish Troubles, which lasted broadly from the late 1960s to the late 90s, was, to put it mildly, a deeply turbulent and traumatic period in British and Irish history. I won't go into the history of this episode, there are plenty of videos out there that explain it already, but essentially sectarian violence between Catholics and Protestants led to the long-term deployment of the British Army throughout the province of Ulster. For the Republican guerrilla forces, typified by the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, the deployment of British soldiers and the re-equipping of the Ulster police with lightly armoured vehicles represented a problem. They were largely very lightly equipped, reliant on small arms to conduct the hit-and-run raids and ambushes that they used to inflict casualties on the security forces. Logical tactics, because in any stand-up fight against the authorities, they were almost inevitably going to get the worst of it. Firearms could be more easily smuggled into the territory, stored in secret caches, and retrieved for use in operations before being hidden away again than heavier weapons. But the increased use of armoured vehicles by the security forces meant that the IRA's active cells had great difficulty in doing damage in their attacks. As a result, naturally, weapons like IEDs, emplaced in culverts under roads, became a standard tactic. But this did limit the IRA unit's tactical capabilities and expose them to interception during the setting up of any such attack. What they really needed were light anti-armour weapons. International support, primarily from Libya, meant that a very limited supply of such weapons, mainly RPG-7s, from the Warsaw Pact countries, did get into their hands. And these could do formidable damage to the light vehicles utilised for internal security by the British Army and the Ulster Police. But numbers of these weapons were always limited, and ammunition supplies extremely low. So the IRA began to develop weapons of their own that could destroy armoured vehicles. And this led to a quite frankly remarkable line in weapon development. Initial attempts were to develop a drogue grenade. This was a hand-thrown device, apparently modelled on the Soviet RKG-3 anti-tank grenade. Essentially built with a standard empty food tin as the body, this was then fitted with a shaped charge explosive that proved capable of penetrating the thin armour on British Army Pig APCs and the armoured Land Rovers used by the police. But it was a very short-ranged weapon, hardly ideal. The IRA's technical division then came up with what the British Army called the Improvised Projected Grenade. This was a single shot and reloadable grenade launcher of rather basic design. Though it did mean the user was able to launch an explosive projectile at greater range than the hand grenades, it was a primitive affair that wasn't particularly useful against moving vehicles. It seems instead to have been used mainly to fire high explosives over walls into security forces compounds. It also apparently had one hell of a kick, and anyone firing the device could expect to suffer a bruised shoulder. Obviously this still wasn't up to what the IRA wanted, so they went back to the drawing board and in the early 1990s fielded a new weapon, the Projected Recoilless Improvised Grenade, or PRIG for short. Again, the British Army designation. And this was a huge improvement. A shoulder-fired weapon, the Prig used the same tin can-style projectile as the earlier drogue grenade. This had a 600 gram, 1 pound 5 ounce, Semtex plastic explosive charge with a metal cone liner that acted as a heat-shaped charge, essentially the same type of warhead as used on many military anti-tank weapons. I haven't been able to find any definite figures on penetration capability, but such a warhead with a diameter of roughly 70mm would be quite capable of punching through any target the Prig was likely to be fired at. The Prig itself was essentially a simple steel tube to which was affixed an electric trigger mechanism, often made up of a light bulb holder as an arming switch. Once armed, the main trigger could be pulled, which sent an electric current from standard household batteries to ignite the propelling charge. This was made up of a simple black powder explosive, nothing especially complicated there. But what was clever was the Prig's projectile firing method. For this, the Prig's designers borrowed from a contemporary anti-tank weapon, the Ambrust. Traditional recoilless weapons generally utilise the same method of operation. The propelling charge detonates, shooting the projectile forward. But the force that moves in the opposite direction, which would normally cause recoil, 
is allowed to vent out the back of the weapon. This, however, causes several issues. The back blast from a weapon, such as an RPG or recoilless rifle, is extremely loud and noticeable. It is also a problem for those wanting to use such a weapon in a confined space, such as a room, or even an enclosed urban area, such as an alleyway. In fact, the back blast can represent a significant hazard to the firer or other personnel if they are used in confined spaces without a suitable exit point for the force to vent. Conventional militaries generally train anti-tank weapon operators to bear this in mind as part of their qualification on these sorts of weapons. But the Amburst utilised another method. Because every action has an equal and opposite reaction, the recoil of the weapon can be neutralised by a projectile of equal weight being fired in the opposite direction to the main projectile. The Ambrose did this by having the propelling charge located between two pistons, with the anti-tank projectile in front of one, and a plastic counterweight behind the other. Of course, you don't want to be shooting a solid projectile out behind you, where it could ricochet all over the place, so the counterweight was composed of 5,000 plastic flakes that would immediately explode in the spray out of the rear of the Ambrose when it was fired. This reduced the danger zone behind an Ambrose firing to only one metre which meant you could use an Ambrust to take on a main battle tank from an enclosed space and suffer nothing in immediate consequence except the world's most rapid confetti scattering. The effect would also minimise the weapon's flash and smoke signature, a very important consideration in a close-range ambush of an armoured vehicle. It was this counterweight concept that the Prig replicated. The propelling charge was located between the projectile and a dispersible counterweight, that would negate the weapon's recoil when fired. And here the IRA took an interesting extra step. They weren't particularly keen on spending money on expensive plastic flakes that then had to be precisely packed into containers that would fit the prig. They came up with a far simpler solution. The counterweight for the prig projectile was two packets of digestive biscuits, a common and delicious snack that can be found in literally any shop in Britain. These would be wrapped in a suitable cloth and crushed up, and were then able to serve as the counterweight to the projectile. So, when you fired a prig, what you got was an old soup tin or similar, capable of penetrating the armour of most APCs coming out of the front, whilst out of the back you got a fine spray of cookie crumbs. This all might seem a bit nuts, but the prig does appear to have seen use. By the time of the IRA ceasefire in 1997, it had been used in several actions against the security forces, and a number had been recovered by the British, who concluded that some limited form of serial production was being undertaken of the weapon. The subsequent Good Friday Agreements of 1998 meant that peace finally came to Northern Ireland, and that peace has, largely, been maintained since. As a result, the Prigs have either been retired or returned to their hiding points in case of future need. But this much is sure, it remains an extremely interesting weapon and one that fully demonstrates the ingenuity that can be put into these sorts of devices.